So I just wanted to give you guys a little taste, and I'm going to talk now just a tiny bit about some of the influences to my like in my work, and I'm starting again with something that I experienced in college, which is uh, I had a professor um, stage a performance of John Cage's 433, which I don't know if everybody knows, but is um, a performance in which a musician is on stage. Um, opens, let's say they're playing on a piano, can be played on many different instruments, opens the piano, there's the first, um, oh my god, what is the word for this, the first chord? The first, uh, oh my gosh, I'm forgetting, anyways, the first uh, movement, there we go, and this is a piece of three movements, um, and sits there and does nothing, so it's a piece about listening to silence, or to the, the sound of silence. Um, and this, this piece was really influential to my thinking about art and also the process. On one hand, I'm an abstract painter or an abstract maker, thinker of image making. And this really, I think, was a way to think about abstraction, right? If silence was something that is not there, if we're talking about the absence of something, the absence of sound, then this piece was about making that absence visible. And I was really interested in that sort of shift that this piece really created. It was sort of uh, demarcating this space within which one can pay attention to something in a different way. And I think printmaking sort of is that too, right? It's, it's a set of parameters based in a process that allows you to do something within it. Um, uh, also, I started thinking about scores. Um, more recently, I kind of came back to this piece and thinking about a score as a kind of diagram. And I'm going to show these, these are two experimental scores that I was really interested in as drawings and as abstract drawings and, and pattern, drawings about pattern. Um, I was interested in how they were also maps for sound, that they were about a translation, a visual, a translation from the visual to the, to the auditory. Um, and how it could be followed, but it also had this space for interpretation. Um, I really love the one on the left, which really feels like very, very celestial or like, outer space like and that like I, I like thinking about how it maps space and time right because we're used to seeing typical scores on the bars no yes no yes okay yeah on bars right that they read yeah. them from left on the city yeah, there you go thank you <laughs> from left to right and here that has been completely changed like where does one begin and where does one end up and maybe that is also can be shifted or how one decides to read it um so another, so John Berger, this is an excerpt from Ways of Seeing. Um, this is something I often teach to uh, beginning level, introductory level courses, because I think it really speaks to what it means to learn to draw and to learn to really carefully observe something. I'm just gonna read the first part. It is seeing which establishes our place in the surrounding world. We explain that world with words, but words can never undo the fact that we are surrounded by it. The relation between what we see and what we know is never settled. Each evening we see the sun set, we know that the earth is turning away from it, yet the knowledge, the explanation, never quite fits the sight. So what, again, there's this, for me in this, in this text, there's this sort of place in the middle that's kind of abstract. He's saying that like between the, what we see literally and then what we know about what we see, there's this, there's this distance that can't really be closed. Um, and it's in that distance that I feel like I like to think about situating my work. That the, sort of this gap is not quite un, sort of known and sort of seen, but not quite either. Um, and I think I'm constantly looking for spaces like that that I sort of grab onto. And um, maps are definitely one of the places where I identify that kind of slippage. And the slippage here is between the 2D and the 3D, right? There's um, the Mercator projection, which is the map you typically see, has it, it, essentially, all maps have errors in them. They all distort the, the Earth because it's really not possible to flatten something three-dimensional accurately. So each of these is a different projection, a different attempt at sort of flattening the world to minimize one or another type of distortion. And I just think it's so interesting that, again, this, the map is a diagram. And we can think about that diagram as helping us understand something abstract, something that can't really be contained by us, or we can't see the whole thing. We can, can't see the whole Earth. Um, but this helps us to, to understand it. Um, so again, that, I'm really interested in that slippage. Um, so I'm going to kind of dive into some work I made in 2017. Um, and I spent 
a year, as Chris said, I was, I've done a bunch of residencies, and I spent a year living in New Mexico, um, in Roswell, actually. And I think it was really during this year, from 2016 to 2017, when I was out there, that this idea of the map and that, that space between 2D and 3D uh, became really, really important and came to the forefront of my thinking. Um, and that was because, I, if, I mean, I think part of Texas might be this way, though I haven't explored that much of it yet, um, where you, you drive and you can see so, so far that as you drive, you're like eight miles an hour, you kind of keep going and you, the scene just like barely changes. It's like barely anything is changing because it's just, you see so, so far. Um, and I thought that that, and that was just such a striking experience of, of time and space um, that sort of stuck with me and made me think again about sort of mapping space or how we understand space. And I went to the very large array, which is in contact, you know, the film, which I always loved as a kid. Um, and I thought, oh, look, here there's this other kind of translation also happening like between great distances. From the Earth, these radio telescopes are collecting data, essentially numbers from outer space, and then that data gets translated by scientists into images of what we then see, what we can see as a picture um, of outer space, which I thought, I hadn't, I hadn't quite understood that that's how radio telescopes work, but it's just numbers that then get sort of interpreted based on their knowledge, uh, or like what the numbers tell you about like the gases out there. So, or the matter out there, or the things we can't see that are out there. Um, so I guess like, here there is this image for me is sort of like an indicator of both these types of things, thinking about space and also thinking about the kind of translation of knowledge. Um, and here's an image of the landscape in New Mexico. It is so, so flat that it's, it's really an uninterrupted horizon. Like If you look all the way on the right, there's like a tiny little, little tiny peak. I don't know if you see it. And that's a mountain. <laughs> Um, you can barely see it. Like if it's even a little cloudy, you can't see it because it's, it's just so far away. But it was a really clear day this day. So, and here's one more. And this one is of um, this from outside of my studio. And one of the, the most amazing things I've never seen before is that you could see the sunset along the entire horizon there. So you turned 360 and you saw the effects of the sun disappearing across the entire dome. As so you can kind of see it here. Um, that the sun is setting on the sets in the west, yes, oh my gosh. I'm so nervous that I always forget things that are really basic. But um, <laughs> uh, as the sun is setting on the west, you start to see like color theory in action, and the, the complementary color starts to appear across the sky. And so if, if I had a time lapse of this, you would see that violet like extending at the very bottom on the right, extending into the whole sky until it became night. But you, I mean, it was like the best, like, I don't know, light show ever that I've ever seen in my life, like just standing outside and like turning around in a circle. So I'm showing this because it was super influential to my work, um, sort of thinking about time and space, thinking about how the diagram is a kind of abstraction. Um, so here are some of the paintings I made while I was living there. I'll show some close-ups right now. Um, so I started becoming really interested in how I could um, use, like, include a, a some kind of observed light into my work. So I, you know, I was like, the sunset, perfect. The cheesiest thing, but also kind of like the most direct way to talk about light outside. Um, and I also started thinking a lot about the grid as a kind of mapping. And I thought it would be kind of funny to map what was under, like if I made a sunset and then mapped that sunset onto a grid where the grid indicated what was below it. Um, and I think something that I do a lot in my work is like, I tend to like really uh, allow myself to go with that first idea, even if it's really ridiculous, such as this. <laughs> I think like deciding I'm just gonna map what was under and the thing under is like just a sunset. Um, but I thought that sort of, I was interested in that repetition, that reiteration of, um, of my painting in some way, or to create a way to read the painting in a different way. Um, I also became really interested in having things happen simultaneously on a painting, or like thinking about multiple times or multiple spaces in a painting, and using sort of complicating the space of the painting, like the foreground, the ground, the background, kind of making as much space within a narrow field. Um, here's another painting. I was trying to do like two parts of the sunset at once across the painting. And I also became interested in sort of ways of seeing, so I ended up gravitating towards like portals or mirror 
windows as, as forms. Um, here's just a sketch um, of this painting almost, when it was almost done. Um, I just want to talk a tiny bit about the process of this work. So none of it is really planned in advance. I usually start with a sense of, of a shape or of a color that I want that's sort of like a starting point, and from there the painting develops pretty intuitively, making sort of big decisions and then waiting and looking to decide what the next decision will be. Um, and here is an image, I'm going to show you yes, more of these. On the left, this is an image from uh, an astronomy textbook. I was looking at a lot of science and astronomy textbooks at the time, too. Um, and so thinking about viewing devices or ways of looking or tools for ex expanding our perceptions, such as microscopes and telescopes, became really interesting to me. You can see sort of the way that I really just drew from that kind of directly. Um, but this book was, it's like such a great book. It was published in 1925, and it's mostly made up of these like hand-drawn diagrams of celestial events. Um, and I really like that they felt so subjective, that they felt, and also so, so sort of, I don't know, touched in a way that a lot of today, like contemporary pictures of outer space just are so, they're all digitally rendered, and you're never, they're kind of like look really beautiful, but you're not sure like how real it is, and then this question of realness comes into play. Um, so I really like that these were not like that, that they were clearly about observation. They were documents of observation and also are trying really hard to like, indicate time, like this one on the left. I mean, there it's different types of solar coronae, coron or coron but um, they also feel like it could be like a time lapse. So, going back to the print, I just kind of wanted to show like what a lot of the work tends to look like. So along the way of making paintings, I often make either prints or drawings, and during this time I was making a bunch of prints. Um, I made over two dozen Prints, and they kind of functioned as a way to develop the vocabulary that I was trying to come up with to talk about mapping and to talk about these things I've been talking about. Um, and this, these are all, again, watercolor monotypes. Um, and a lot of what happens, so often paintings lead to other paintings, but more often paintings lead to prints or prints lead to new, to new paintings. So they kind of are this essential sort of middle ground of generation, like they're very generative for me. Um, and I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that they, um, they sort of exist as this space of freedom. Like there's such a low risk to making one of these, like it's just a paper that is lost as opposed to like the possibility of like a painting I could work on, working on for a few weeks. Um, and also since I can't totally control everything, I feel like I end up feeling quite free to try anything I want out. Um, I guess one thing I haven't mentioned is that in printmaking I primarily stuck and have the most experience working in monotype, uh, belief, and um, actually collagraph prints. So I'm really interested in the lower, the low technology, the low, no acid, um, low chemical stuff because I feel like I can really engage it with my hands. So it feels like I'm more like building an object that is then being sort of indexed rather than something that is like a lot of time spent on the development of the image. Um, so this is a, a linoleum cut print that I made while I was there. Um, and I started to be really interested in, there's a lot of repetition in my work, but especially interested in doubling um, sometime around 2017. So another role I mentioned earlier that printmaking has played in my work has really been as like a, this, the space of experimentation. And when I left Roswell, I moved to was say at New York for a residency, and there I had this really wild barn studio that was like really dark and really wet and kind of a horrible place to make paintings in. And so I was like, this is perfect. I'm gonna make like super dirty work. I'm gonna make charcoal, graphite drawings, I'm gonna see what happens. I just I wanna work like large scale and quickly on some drawings. And so these are some of the things I ended up making. Um, this really doesn't work as a digital image, but here is, uh, let me see where the, oh gosh, you can't see that either on this. Anyways, let me see if I have a better one. Here, here you can see, basically all of these were made, they're all rubbings of this floor that was in my studio. So it's a raked, wavy raked floor, and I, it's, I just was like, well, these, these marks are exactly what I like to draw. <laughs> and this is way better. This has this like texture. It's also me like using my space 
And in a lot of my the work that I just showed, I was really interested in the large, some of them were quite large paintings, but I was interested in them feeling architectural or feeling like actual spaces one could enter. So it was really exciting for me to think about how I might, like the, using the space itself to, you know, the, the, the print or the drawing, however you want to call it, um, was really made by touching. It was like touching the whole floor. It was a part, it was a, yeah, part of that floor. So some of them had multiple layers here. I layered like two, like layer, I think it was charcoal, graphite, and then I went over it with an eraser. Um, and in person, they have a lot of presence. They feel very much like static or some kind of, they kind of feel like both, some of them, the dark ones that you can't see at all in this, um, really feel like voids, but also feel like they're kind of coming out at you because of the, the charcoal being so velvety. So there was something happening that I couldn't get in a painting from the material, but also the, the ability to get the scale to be so big in these works. Um, and so I really started thinking about doorways, these like arch, the arch form that I actually first made in one of in the prints I showed earlier um, became really, really present in my work during this time. And I had also gone to Georgia O'Keeffe's house, and those of you who know her work, she painted this door like, many times in her work. And it was fascinating to see it because it really looks like a void in this wall when you're there because of the way the shadow, like, it's just like perfectly encased in shadow most of the time. Um, but when you see those paintings, of course, they look totally abstract. I just put a black rectangle on this sort of red. Um, I should have included that in here next time. Um, <laughs> um, and here's another doorway I've seen that same year um, in Springfield, Illinois. Okay. So here are a few. And I started also experimenting with folding um, as a way to generate sort of a kind of unit across the piece. So I started thinking about these as sort of clocks, also sort of like a diagram of a horizon or like the horizon on the earth. Um, and here's a detail of that. So this is made from two sheets of paper that were rubbed on the floor. Um, the one on the top is actually a sheet of blue paper that I bleached and then used graphite on top of. So this one has, you know, it's the one on the left. You can see kind of like the shine on the surface of the top and the bottom and stuff like more. it absorbed like more because it was uh, it was um, charcoal. Um, so a lot of things I tend to be someone who really follows the path that starts to become evident in the work. And one of the things that happened was because I was I bought this blue paper and it was a little too dark to use the graphite on, so I ended up I ended up bleaching it. And my test for the bleach was were these pieces here. I wanted to see if I could lighten the paper. And in the process, I was like, oh, like, what if I fold it up and I end up with this grid, and I can use the grid as a way to refold the paper. And I ended up making, sort of by following this sort of like trail, thinking about maps and thinking about um, sort of marking or uh, as they were documenting something as a print, I ended up making, making these. So, Here's just a detail of the surface. Um, and here's how it was made. So I think of this as a kind of print in that it was entirely made by, the, the piece itself was indexed by spraying bleach on top of it. So I would fold it, spray bleach, unfold it, refold it, spray bleach. And so slowly it, was, it created the marks um, that you see on it, or the, the areas of value. Um, and I also became, this is something that I'm still thinking a lot about, which is the fact that this piece sort of was made on the floor and could exist maybe in, ver in, in multiple, um, in variable dimensions and forms, like it could be an object rather than just something that is hung on the wall. Um, here it is installed in the, in the far back there. Um, um, so during the same year, I, was, I did a lot of residencies, so I kind of was able to keep following this trail of interest. And those pieces, those of you who know cyanotypes, these looked a lot like cyanotypes. And because I've been thinking so much about light and so much about space, I was like, well, I should make some cyanotypes because that's really like the light is, is what's making the value. It's what's making the, the, the image on the paper. So um, I decided to go ahead and make some experiments. I've never made a cyanotype before. Um, and so I spent three weeks in Taos making these on a, really, on a little residency there. And these were made by folding, I took that same idea of folding the paper. They were covered, it was covered in the, the cyanotype uh, solution. And I would un, it sort of became a kind of performance, like a private performance of folding and unfolding the piece and then counting and trying to remember sort of like a puzzle, like which 
parts have been exposed to light for how long. So even though they end up just a sort of pretty basic grids that can even be seen as sort of a, what is it, like light, like a test, light t tests of, what are you talking about? Anyways, test strip, thank you, yes, yes. Like, they're kind of like test strips. They have this really active element of the folding and unfolding and trying to figure out how we wanted, like, which rectangles to be darker, which ones to be lighter. Um, and here are a few others. These had the same sort of radial folding. Um, From, from the larger pieces I had made before the drawings. And these are really interesting because um, they were really hard to control. <laughs> um, I, couldn't, I couldn't, you know, it's like very easy for everything to be exposed to light. Um, and then I made a few that I actually cut out some of these circles to use to um, block the light from the paper. And these were done on a kind of mule, like yellows, like it's like a tone, like a yellow, like an off-white paper. So they had this kind of, they turned kind of green in areas. Um, I started to wonder, you know, what my interest in folding really was and how else I could push that forward. And so I started researching different types of folds and I ended up finding this fold called the Miura Ori fold, which has been used by, um, it was actually developed by an astrophysicist in Japan. Um, and he developed it now it's being used a lot to send really large, uh, like especially uh, solar sails um, out into space because they can be compressed into a very small, take a very, very little space but then be very large. Another aspect of this fold is that it's really bouncy, so it's really easy to open and close. So robots can very easily pull it to open it without much effort. And I just became really interested in that also. It's linked to mapping. Also a lot of, actually you can still find maps, some maps, like tourist maps especially, that are, use this fold because they end up in a little square and you can just open them and close them as opposed to like trying to fumble with the whole giant thing. Um, but I thought it was so interesting that they had, this fold has this link to, to mapping, but also like matter, like the compression of matter, thinking about 2D and 3D and the benefits of sort of this like, this ability to transform from one to the other. So I did this experiment um, <laughs> that really did go well. This is, this is the paper exposing to light in the fold, in the shape of the fold. Um, and this is, I did two tests like this, and these are the two things that came out of it. And I always, I'm not sure if I should show these because in a lot of ways these were like huge failures and that I had no way to control to control it because the paper I should have started smaller. <laughs> I mean I had started smaller, but there was sort of like I was really I think it's really indicative of the way I tend to approach things, which is I just want to see if it can work. And so I'm just gonna do it as the way I imagine it needs to be done, and then I'll adjust after. So the one on the left actually completely disintegrated because the paper I bought did not like being submerged in water. And so then I put it all back together. I spent like days like putting back this blue piece of paper, this piece of paper together. Um, and the one on the right, I actually laid it, and if you look carefully, you might be able to see some brick patterns. I laid it on the floor and washed it with a hose. But then there was wind, and so the wind blew it, and then it also tore it, so I had to kind of put it back together. <laughs> but I think there was something about this whole process, the fact that I had to work outside to do it, this, this, in order to get the right amount of light for the process to work, that I think is also something that printmaking, sort of its role as a process has in my practice, which is it takes me out of being like alone in the studio. It also allows for failure to exist as a learning experience, because the only way you can figure out what you want is by testing things out. Um, and that's something that I really, really appreciate about your making, that it feels like it's okay, it's always okay if it doesn't work. Um, so yeah, so here is just another install shot. And from that, those two large ones, I decided I'll make a really big one, but I'm gonna make it in four parts. So each sheet was like, I don't know, maybe like 36 to 48 inches on each side. And here's my little setup. Um, and <laughs> yeah, so um, this was the last piece I made in this residency. And I finally figured out I just needed to like let the water out of my little pool and like let it sort of drain over my paper to stop the exposure process. Um, so I, I was really excited to be working in this way, which is a whole new way for me. And I thought a lot about Michelle Stewart's work. She makes a lot of rubbings using um, the dirt found on specific sites. So they're kind of documents of sites. So these, 
these drawings are just rubbings using like on on site. I think it's Saverville. I'm not 100 percent sure. Um, and they're from different levels of Earth. So I think it's the deeper you go, the darker the Earth gets. So they're sort of a kind of mapping of like, the depth of, of the land. Um, so I showed some color monotypes earlier that were water-based um, uh, water crayons and so I watercolor. But usually when I work in monotype, I end up working just with black ink. And I use it a lot, like I would use charcoal. Um, and so it become, it's, it also is the method I use to sort of find images. And uh, this is why I was saying that I think printmaking often is really generative to, it ends up leading to a lot of work. Um, because I have sort of this way, it sort of allows me to sort of work the surface to find what I'm looking for in a really intuitive way. Um, so here are a few prints that I made while I was making the cyanotypes, like at, at night when I couldn't work on the cyanotypes, I made these. Um, and so they are both additive, you know, like added with the brush and reductive, like wiping away to bring the, the white of the plate back out. And um, just to show a little bit how that ended up influencing the, the next body of work I made, um, I ended up on this island at another residency. I really lived in no one place for many years, everybody. Wow. But here, um, I think a lot, I had actually, when I put this slideshow together, I realized just how much these prints influenced what came after. Um, so you can see this is, this is like other things in progress. But I really, really started thinking much more about how and observing the light outside as a way to decide my color palette. Um, and I think that had a lot to do with actually working outside for those weeks in Taos. Um, and also working on that large scale, those the bleach pieces I made, some of them inside and some of them outside, the smell was very intense. So um, there was something about taking my practice outside that actually influenced the way I started thinking about making my paintings. And so here are a few of what I made. And you can see this wasn't, I didn't take the picture to the studio. I realized later that they were like, it was like exactly the same palette, and I was really excited by that. I was like, wow, I guess it, like, you know, your environment really influences you, and it really definitely, my place definitely influences me when I'm working. And so you can see that repetition and gradients became a way to play with light in a way that I was able to control in this work. And also more of the sort of portals or looking through spaces. Um, does anyone have any questions? I'm gonna keep I'm gonna show a few more things, but I didn't you know if anyone Um, so I often also work, feel free to chime in if you do this as I keep going. Um, so I also often work, I don't know if you've already noticed this, but in series with my prints. So I tend to make a bunch like within one session of printing. And um, I'm really, that's something that I guess like I noticed recently because I made this series, I'm saying this in the right order, of prints. And I feel like it's a very natural way to work for me, just to kind of think about the one that I made before and kind of move on to another one and play with the sort of elements and the visual language I've developed in the first. And I realized I never do that in painting. So I went to Skarkiga in the summer of 2018, and I realized that one of the reasons I get so overwhelmed and sort of anxious really about making paintings, like sometimes it's a really painful experience, um, is because I'm not, sometimes I need to work a little faster. I need to have something else like printmaking, for example, or drawing that's sort of happening simultaneously. So here you can see this like grid of small, uh, these are all paintings on panel. And I allowed myself, there was no, there was like a little makeshift print shop, but instead I tried to bring that sense of printmaking into, into painting itself to see if I could work quick, more quickly and kind of develop images from the previous one in a more organic way. Um, with paintings, especially the bigger ones, I'm typically trying to not repeat myself in composition. Sometimes there's similarities, 
but I'm really trying to do something different from the previous thing, sort of as a way to build sort of the constellation of the world I'm thinking of. And so yeah, here, um, and in the small ones, I allow myself a lot more freedom to repeat, and in prints, I definitely allow myself the freedom to repeat. Here's another small series that were all made sort of one after the other. And here are some of the larger pieces that were made at the same time. So in some cases, the smaller pieces really worked. The, I took the palette from the one on the top left for this one. And the arch just has kept, has really remained uh, an important sort of architectural or structural form in the work, or shape of the work. Um, and so one of the things I haven't really talked about is that I tend to set pretty strict parameters for myself as I begin a new body of work. And uh, when I moved to Ohio right after being at Skowhegan, I was teaching at Oberlin College there, I decided that I would set, I would try to make large paintings as though they were small. So I, I had a bunch of big canvases ready to go. Um, and I also told myself I was allowed to layer as many times as I needed to find the image. So they became very sort of physical paintings in a way I hadn't had the time or space to do before. Um, and it was it was a very I think like very exciting actually. I'm sorry, the documentation for these is not great because I don't have uh, the professional images of them yet. But these I sort of wanted to give myself all the freedom that I hadn't given myself in painting. And all of that came out of sort of my work in printmaking in particular, my process in printmaking. So I also allowed myself to repeat compositions or elements of compositions really directly. Um, and I became really interested in this like double, double oval or double, double like uh, pointy, I don't know what to call it, like kind of an almond shape, really came in strongly in a vertical composition. And I started thinking about them as eyes and looking in the night or trying to look through something that's like hard to see. Um, so here, I'll show a few of these because they're quite similar. Um, and I was really interested, I'd been working in a lot of places that had a lot of light. Um, and it was very gray in Ohio, like all the time, every day. So I was like, well, I've never actually tried to capture this kind of, like the kind of dust or kind of uh, diffuse lighting before. So that became sort of another task of this work that I was really interested in. So I don't know, these, I think, just became very full, full paintings. Like, I worked on them until it was, I really couldn't anymore. And they ended up leading to this, a couple, three different groups, series of screen prints, which I worked in very little, um, actually, and worked on them as, as monotypes. So they have a watercolor element in them that was put through the screen, and then they were printed on top of a few layers. Here's a close-up of, these are two different series, they're editions of seven. Um, each one with a different, some element that is different. Um, so you can sort of see the watercolors in the two like oval shapes. Well, on the one on the right, and the one on the left is actually in the center, it's in the opposite part of the, of the print. So like everything but the oval part. And it also came out in this, this is the first wood cut I actually ever made, which I just finished in December. Um, it's really small, but the double, sort of double eyes or the double, double form again. Um, and here, these are, these are, just, I'm going to show a few paintings from 2019. Uh, when I decided, this was right after I was in Ohio, I was like, I want the paintings to have more air. Like, I've made them so intense. And can I use, can the color indicate space? Like, can I make the color be atmospheric and like, like light, like atmospheric light? So I really opened them up and let sort of transparent layers exist in a way I hadn't really done before actively. So I think these are, these are the most recent paintings I'm going to be showing. I mean, I like I like his work a lot. Yeah, I don't I don't think I think about him like a lot directly, but de definitely, yeah, yeah. Um, yes, I'm like thinking about um, the work you like we're doing on the floor at that bar mm -hmm. studio, mm -hmm. and it, like to me like there's such a parallel with your 
being like, oh, the cheesy sunset. I guess I'll use that as a structure. But is there something about like, you, you seem so interested in honoring these spaces. Like when you said, the world I see, I was really excited because I thought your work is all about honoring these maybe overlooked little things that happen every day or the wood floor of a barn that like the other artists might not even want to work in or, you know, mm -hmm. is there something about that printmaking, I guess, allows you to focus on those overlooked spaces um, or overlooked moments in daily life that's different than painting? I don't know. That's such a good question. Um, I never thought about it in those terms, but I do think that, I guess like, this is, your question is making me think about why I think sometimes poetry is so good, because it can sort of honor like really small things that are, are definitely overlooked or not given language or not given time. And I, mean, I don't know in what way, I mean definitely with the more, with the, the practice of like really engaging the space, definitely. I was like really in love with that floor <laughs> by the end of my time there. Um, I don't know, I, I don't know if I really fully understand, maybe I did, I don't know, did I understand your question? <laughs> now I'm wondering, but I guess like I'm pointing to poetry because I feel like I've been thinking a lot about sort of why there are some poets especially that seem to be able, like, I wish my paintings could do that. Like, I wish they could, they could grab onto the thing that the language, this, like, fractured language is able to do better, right? Or that maybe an image can kind of do, but somehow this language, like, really, like, takes you there, but doesn't necessarily explain it to you. And I don't know, yeah. Yeah. Yes? So I really love the way you talked about how the prints allowed you to uh, inform your your painting, mm -hmm. and then it, later in your discussion, it was going back. The paintings were in right. print. Right. So do you see them now more on equal footing? Because at the beginning, it seemed yeah. like they were more uh, a portal or a way to get into a painting right. or a test. Yes, yeah, so whatever. Like, like, and so, but later it seemed like it was coming back. I'm so intrigued. The place of printmaking in your work is it is it like rising and stature or am I? I think I think it's, I mean I'm curious to see what the next couple years bring now that I'll be like a little bit more steady here because I think one of the things it's sort of taken different roles depending on sort of when I have access to facilities for example but also I think where I've been with my other work and I think over time definitely they've. I think right now what I would say is that they're having a more sort of back and forth. So they're in conversation. They're more in conversation. More vigorously than they were. Yes, exactly. And I think in part it's been because I've had the opportunity to make more of them more regularly. Um, so what I was going to show right now is actually I started working with this, this printmaker, this master printer, Marina Ancona in New York. And she, I met her actually at Scout Keegan, and she was like, Beth, why don't you make colorful monotypes? And I was like, well, because they're a little unwieldy for me. Like, I don't have all the inks and all the colors that I have with my paints. And when I make them with paint, they come out kind of bad because like, the consistency doesn't like transfer the same way. And she is a master of monotype printing. Like, I didn't even know that that was possible, but she really is. I have learned so much from how she has sort of collab like, our collaboration. Um, but essentially, one of the answers so I can keep talking about your question. I think right now what has happened because I have, I've been working with her is that I'm allowing myself to pull from the paintings, and so now the prints are becoming sort of painterly. <laughs> well, they're definitely more painterly, these more recent ones. Um, but also, I'm allowing myself to repeat painting compositions in a way that I didn't have a need for. Like there was no. Like why would I do that when I'm really just trying to like develop a new book? Like I'm kind of trying to expand my vocabulary. But it's been really interesting to have the chance to use this as a way to revisit paintings and create them um, a very like uh, what is the word? I'm revisit paintings or revisit prints? Revisit using the prints to revisit paintings. Oh, so for instance, this was this was based on a on a painting a fresco I made at Skowhegan that then was covered up. So it kind of this is like the only version of it that really exists now as a work of art, aside from like a photograph of the, the, the fresco. And she is, she is able to pull up to four, uh, up to three ghosts from the first pull. So I end up with, so the, the one, this was the first one on the left, and the one on the right was the last ghost that we were able to pull, which was really, really light. And then it gets printed on top with more layers. So it gets like sort of more value range developed over time. And this was the, the second one. So I ended up with a series of three 
that allow me to explore that same composition three times to make three different works. And that that is like a whole new way of working that I've never had access through, through with like mon monotypes in particular, or even with other printmaking. Like I never make so many different decisions across like the same print list. Like with relief printing, I'll just make this, you know, it's, it's an addition of 30 and they're all the same. There's no variation. Um, are those also watercolor or different? These are oil based. <clears throat> yeah, so they're, we use lithography inks for this. Yeah, and so she mixes them with um, a few different modifiers to get them to do different things. So she's really good at making beautiful layers of like roll, like transparency that gets rolled on, which was something that I did not, was never taught how to do So as a student, so totally new for me. Are you more in collaboration than really? I mean, in a way, because you don't yeah. have control over the actual production of the very last piece in the way that you might as a piece. Well, essentially what she does, the, the collaboration is mostly that she prepares things for me. So she'll ask me, do you want a transparent, like, how transparent do you want this to be? And she'll help me mix that color. And she'll show me the options. And then she'll roll it on the plate for me. And then I, I didn't actually include an image. And then I'll, like, wipe away or I'll paint on top of it. So in a way, it's more like she's a facilitator that has a lot of knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> extreme, extreme knowledge. Um, so here, so these are like a bunch that got pulled from the same. Here you can see the, the four that have that same. The one on the left has is the least visible, but that same sort of double kind of like kapow shape. And these are two that got finished that were finished from that from that set. So again, the, this, the one on the left is the first pull, and then the one on the right was the last one that both got worked into more. Um, How do you work into them? Do you do another you know print on top of them, or work into a directly? Um, so here, I'll explain it with this one. So the one on the right was the very first thing I printed. So I painted onto a plexiglass plate, what you see. And then it got printed once, and then the ghost got printed on the one on the left. And so then I went back into both of them. I would take the plexi plate, trace what I had already drawn, and then paint on it again to put the second layer. And so that these are the same prints when they're finished. Um, so this is like the one on the right here, that's just like one path, one pass through the press, and this now has like three or, three or four um, to finish building the image. Um, and the one on the left here was almost done, and I added one more layer to finish it on, on this um, here, as you see it here. So I guess it's like just painting on a new piece of flexi and creating a second, third, or fourth layer, if that does that make sense. So the paper gets re wet each time and then passes through the press again. Or do you find people might be more interested in you know, purchasing both or all three? Or, uh, and they, yeah, I feel like they, if I were to get one, I, I just would want like all of them. <laughs> you know, all three, because they just are like variations. And I, right. being a graphic designer, the, the design process is variations. And my right. clients don't see all of that, but I love the variations. Right. <laughs> yeah, well, that's what's been, I mean, like, that's what I loved about this, like, that, the, the variations of it. I, one, I think these, yeah, those. these two were purchased as a pair. So, you oh, you're sorry. right. Yeah, they were purchased as a pair. Not was little at all. This is a painting I just made in December. It doesn't have a title yet. Um, and I then went in January to work with Maria again. And I actually, I was like, I'm just going to use this painting. I feel like it's perfect for to create variations from because of the way I painted it and my interest in sort of the, these, these different types of blues working together. Um, here are the three that came out of out of working from that sort of that painting. Um, and I, I mean, I just like love these so much. I just more than I love have loved other prints I've made, especially like now I have like four of this painting in a way, right? But I, I don't know. There's something about printmaking that I also love that I I feel very comfortable giving them away. You know, there's something about the sharing and the circulation of prints that I think has always felt very good to me as someone who tends to make work that's very that's unique and hard to get rid of in a way. Um, and you feel like they're married. I mean, you're doing so much painting on the prints. I mean, they're oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, these especially um, because also they're, they're quite you know they're 22 by 30 inches, so they're also they have like a presence 
Um, and usually my prints tend to be a bit smaller because it's easier for me to make them when they're of a certain scale. So, um, yeah, and I think this is the last thing. Yeah, and then I have also started working on a woodblock and I'm totally obsessed with it. Then, yeah, so this is the last thing. Yeah, this is the end. <laughs>